that is the only coverage for for the exam you know, next week. So by the way, the exam will be on unit exam will be on Wednesday next week. That will be seven to eight a.m. And um, I hope you already joined in the Google Classroom that I set up for my topics. You know, okay, and um, uh, I, I'm not very well versed with the LMS. This is this a platform, guys. No? It's a big adjustment for, for us teachers as well. I think as sa inyo kong part, it's a big adjustment. It's not user-friendly at all. Anyway, um, lang, kanang, I made a Google Classroom for, for, my, for my topics. So can you join? respectively, you know, so if you belong to ANC, can you join to class ANC? Okay, and nga na lang. So, uh, for the exam next week, uh, it will be 7 to 8, and um, I will start posting it on uh, 6.45, 6.45 a.m., okay? So, the exam will be 50 items, and it's... Uh, there were there are a few case based questions, pero majority is uh, conceptual. So as long as you know what this concept means, for example, this regulation of the epigenome or the so mga concepts, no? Um, post -trans post transcriptional silencing, ano siya? So, ano? Uh, like uh, what's the other one? Ano? No? So so. So let's start with the first group. Thank you. Um, so good morning, everyone, <clears throat> and good morning, Doc. So we are Group 1, and we will be reporting about the first instruction, which was to describe the nuclear organization for DNA. But before we head on to the report, we will be showing you a brief video about the meeting. Share sound. Wala. Uh, a share sound sa Ray. Um, is pa share. Uh, now, as a view options, it tried it on a share, share sound, share record. Humans around the world have much in common, but also enormous diversity. Some of the differences between each of us come from our environments and life experiences, but our DNA plays an important role in determining our appearance, our traits, and our health. There are thousands of genes in the human genome. Sequence changes in individual genes can determine if we have freckles, can digest lactose, have wet or dry earwax, are red-green colorblind, or are likely to have blue eyes or think broccoli tastes better. Individual genes can also determine if we will develop sickle cell anemia, cystic fibrosis, or Huntington's disease. Multiple genes act together with our environment to determine our... For a while lang, guys, magbalik ni yung Sherry para dili siya para... Thank you. 
Humans around the world have much in common, but also enormous diversity. Some of the differences between each of us come from our environments and life experiences, but our DNA plays an important role in determining our appearance, our traits, and our health. There are thousands of genes in the human genome. Sequence changes in individual genes can determine if we have freckles, can digest lactose, have wet or dry earwax, are red-green colorblind, or are likely to have blue eyes or think broccoli tastes bitter. Individual genes can also determine if we will develop sickle cell anemia, cystic fibrosis, or Huntington's disease. Multiple genes act together with our environment to determine our hair and skin color, our height, our weight, our blood pressure, and our risk of developing type 2 diabetes, depression, cancer, some autoimmune disorders, and many other conditions. In spite of all these potential differences, humans are 99.9% .9 genetically identical. How is it possible that we are all so similar and yet so different? Let's zoom in to the smallest genetic unit, a single nucleotide of deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. A DNA nucleotide is composed of sugar and phosphate groups, and one of four nitrogenous bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, annotated in shorthand as A, T, G, and C. The sugar and phosphate groups form the DNA structural backbone, allowing nucleotides to concatenate into a long single strand of DNA, while the bases determine DNA sequence. The chemical properties of DNA allow bonds to form between the bases in order to create a double strand, with two hydrogen bonds pairing A and T, and three pairing C and G. Though different types of human cells can be very different in appearance and function, they contain the same genome, which consists of about three gigabases, or three billion base pairs, of DNA. All the DNA in the cell would be about two meters in length if it were stretched out, and must be condensed down to fit into cells as small as 10 micrometers across. The DNA is first coiled into its canonical helix structure, and then wrapped around histone proteins to form a DNA protein structure called a nucleosome. These nucleosomes can be further wound and coiled together to create a compact structure that fits into the nucleus. During cell division, the DNA is organized into tightly wound chromosomes, 46 in total, with 23 coming from each parent. These chromosomes can be easily and accurately separated during cell division guaranteeing that each new cell contains an exact copy of DNA. Outside of cell division, the DNA is decondensed in the nucleus, allowing greater accessibility. The transcriptional machinery regulates expression of the approximately 20,000 genes, which, although they correspond to less than 2% of all genomic DNA, encode all the proteins necessary to build and run a human cell. So to return to the original question, how is it possible for all of human diversity to exist when we are 99.9% .9 genetically similar? It is important to remember that the 0.1% of DNA that varies, on average, between each of us, actually corresponds to about 3 million differences across the genome, with 20,000 of them, on average, falling into protein-coding genes. Although that equals approximately one difference per gene, in reality, these differences are not evenly distributed across the coding regions. Differences in DNA sequence are called variants, and those affecting a single position are called single nucleotide variants, or SNVs. Common SNVs that occur in more than 1% of a population are called single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. SNPs along with larger-scale sequence changes like deletions, duplications, and rearrangements, create all the richness of human genetic diversity at the population level.
This raises many questions on an individual level as well. How does DNA determine our traits? How can we understand what a gene does and how variants in that gene might affect our lives? What can our DNA tell us about our risk and our loved one's risk of disease? How can information from our genomes improve our medical care? Understanding genetics allows us to apply the concepts of heritability and genetic variation to questions of human health and disease in our world today. So that was. So these are the members under group one. So okay, let us go to the comments next, please. So to recap a bit, we learned that the, the DNA is a spiraling chain-like molecule made up of four types of nucleotides, to which scientists have labeled as your A, adenine, C, cytosine, D, thymine, and your G, amine. We've also learned that a gene is a long stretch of DNA um, with a specific sequence of your A, C, T, and G that code for something. What does, a what does a gene code for? Usually a protein or a group of proteins and others. And in multicellular creatures like ourselves, proteins which are coded for by genes interact with other proteins and molecules to make up living, to make up living cells. Cells then make up tissues, tissues make up organs, organs ultimately make up the entire living creature. And individuals have different traits largely, largely because of these differences or mutations on their genetic code. So for the Instruction number one is to describe the nuclear organization of DNA. So the nuclear organization refers to, basically refers to the spatial distribution of chromatin within a cell nucleus. There are many different levels and scales of nuclear organization. And at light microscopic level, the nuclear genetic material is organized into dispersed transcriptional, transcriptionally active euchromatin or densely packed transcriptionally inactive heterochromatin. Um, next slide. And chromosomes, which are basically made up of proteins and DNA organized into genes with each cell normally containing 23 pairs of chromosome, chromosomes, can only be visualized by light microscopy during cell division. And during mitosis, these chromosomes are organized into paired chromatids connected at the centromeres, the ones in the middle. Uh, next slide, please. The centromeres act as the locus for the formation of a kinetic core protein complex that regulates chromosome segregation at metaphase. The telomeres are repetitive nucle nucleotide sequences that cap the termini of chromatids and permit repeated chromosomal replication without the loss of DNA at the chromosome ends. A chromosome is an entire chain of DNA along with a group of stabilizing protein. And if you were to unravel a chromosome, you would see that it is made up of a made up of chromatin fiber and kind of looks sort of like a spool of yarn. These individual chromatin fibers are composed of a string of nucleosomes. DNA wound around optomeric histone cores with the nucleosomes connected via DNA linkers. And if you zoom in closer at your nucleosomes, it is being wrapped by a string-like structure, and that would be and that would be your chain of DNA. Uh, next. Promoters um, are non coding regions of DNA that initiate gene transcription. They are on the same stra strand and upstream of their associated gene. And your enhancers are regulatory elements that can modulate gene expression across distances by looping back onto promoters and recruiting additional factors that are needed to drive the expression of pre mRNA species. The intronic sequences are subsequently spliced out of the pre-mRNA to produce the, defini the definitive uh, message that includes exons that are translated into protein and three prime and five prime untranslated regions, or your UTR, that may have regulatory functions. In addition to the enhancer, promoter, and UTR sequences, non-coding elements are found throughout the genome, and these include short repeats, regulatory factor binding regions, non-coding regulatory RNAs, and your transposons.
So that was basically it for instruction number one. Um, thank you. Okay, very good. No? So um, in this chapter, uh, it is basic to know that um, DNA is not only responsible for um, to be for expression into proteins to be you know transcribed to RNA to to what they call that um, translated to to proteins. So it's not it's that's not the only pattern for DNA because majority of DNA are non-coding. So when we say coding, so it codes for RNA, the later proteins, okay? But majority of these genetic material are not uh, coded into, into these, um, um, these materials, no? into proteins, RNAs. So majority of them are responsible for genetic regulation. Na ang atong chapter karon and and you are right already no you, you mentioned uh, on the basics of the organization of the DNA so at least uh, with the first question we're able to realize that um, the chromosome is made up of of uh, smaller materials diba? so you have the chromatid you have the uh, uh, hetero, hetero and uh, euchromatin, okay? And you have the nucleosome, which is composed of this uh, histones and the DNA, okay? Nana siya. So at least we are able to, to differentiate. No? So when we say chromosome, it's different from DNA, no? That's not equivalent. And we know that DNA is a smaller particle. Again. Okay, so next group. Thank you so much. Good morning, Doc. And we are the group two. We're going to report the second question, Doc. And these are the members. These colleagues. So, instruction number three, we are assigned to tabulate five elements involved in gene regulation and, and one corresponding application for each. So next slides. So the elements in gene regulations are promoters, enhancers, silencers, insulators, and transposons. So next slide, Slade. So first is a promoter. They are non-coding regions of DNA that initiate gene transcription, and they are on the same strand and upstream of their associated gene. So all eukaryotic genes contain a core promoter. And one common example is a sequence of bases called the tata box. So tata box is where they can find the kung asa mag start ang um, coding. So is next. So second is the enhancers. Um, they are regulatory elements that can modulate gene expression over distance of 100 kb or more by looping back onto promoters and recruiting additional factors that are needed to drive the expression of pre-mRNA species. An example of enhancer is the proximal epiblast enhancer, which is important for which is important during the development of the vertebrate body. So silencers are control regions of DNA that like enhancers may be located thousands of base, pa base pairs away from the gene they control. However, when transcription factors bind to them, expression of gene they control is repressed. Um, silencers, uh, silencers are the repressive counterparts of enhancers. So, next. So, insulators um, are regions limit the effect of other regulatory elements. 
to certain chromosomal boundaries. They create regulatory domains untainted by the regulatory elements in regions outside the domain. In short, they are fu their function is to prevent a gene from being influenced by the activation or repression of its neighbors. So last is the transposons. Act as a locus. Locus means is kung, kung asa ang location sa isa ka particular nga trait or gene um, for the formation of kinetochore protein complex that regulates chromosome segrega segregation at metaphase. And DNA transposons can be used to introduce a new species of foreign DNA into a genome. That's for our group doc. To add to that, no. So not only um, uh, these uh, materials, the genetic materials that you mentioned, but you also have the um, uh, microRNA. This, this for first is not non-coding DNA. So the, the the ones that you mentioned are non-coding DNA. Plus you have the SNPs. You also have this uh, copy number uh, variations, and you also have this uh, non-coding RNA. You have the microRNA and the long non-coding RNA plus epigenome, no? So be able to know the applications for that also, okay? So again, let's go to next group. Thank you, thank you. Any group that will uh, want to proceed? Good morning, Doc. I don't know. Hello, hello. Ah, uh, sige Mike. Madong ogra ka. So we will discuss the composition and importance of the human jet genome. So what is the human genome? The complete set of genetic information in an organism, this is a human genome, and it provides all of the information that the organism requires to function. So this is a collection of uh, long polymers of your DNA. So we will show you a video that briefly discusses the human genome. Most of us have heard of genes, but what are they exactly? A gene is a segment of DNA that contains the instructions for the production of biological molecules, usually proteins. Humans have around 20,000 genes, all containing the information needed to build one or more proteins. Some genes determine physical characteristics such as the colour of our eyes. Others can influence our risk of developing certain conditions such as diabetes. But genes only account for around 2% of all our genetic information, which is made up of more than 3 billion letters of DNA called bases. While we don't yet understand the exact function of all the other 98%, we do know that changes to this DNA can also impact on our health. So where is all this DNA stored? Almost all of our DNA is arranged into tightly coiled structures called chromosomes. Humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, with one of each pair inherited from our father and the other from our mother. Chromosomes are located in the nucleus of a cell. A very small amount of DNA is also found in the mitochondria, a structure which provides energy for the cell. All the DNA contained in one cell is called the genome. We have one copy of our genome in nearly every cell in our body. Our genomes are approximately 99.8% identical to that of every other human being. It's the 0.2% variation in our genome that interests us in healthcare, as understanding it can help in the prediction, prevention, diagnosis and treatment of disease.
For the composition of your genome, we have your nuclear and your mitochondrial gen. For your nuclear genome, it, this is a 24 linear molecule. This is composed of uh, 22 autosomes and two sex chromosomes. So this genome contains about 3.2 billion of your DNA base pairs. So 20,000 protein encoding genes are found within the genome. That is 1.5% of the genome and are responsible for your protein synthesis. The remaining 98.5% 98.5% of the genome are non-coding genes and are responsible for your gene regulation. So we all know what are the non-coding genes. For your mitochondrial genome, this is composed of a mitochondrial DNA or your mDNA, also known as your mDNA. This is an, a double-stranded circular molecule that contains a limited number of your genes. So it is built of 16,569 DNA base pairs. For in the, in the human genome, there are five major classes of functional non-coding coding, coding gene sequences. So first is the promoter and the enhancer region. So this provides binding sites for transcription factors. Second, your binding sites. Binding sites for factors that organize and maintain higher order chromatine structures. Third, your non-coding non regulatory RNAs. So over 60% 60, 60 of the genome is transcribed into RNAs that are never translated, but they, are regulate, but they regu regulate gene expression through a variety of mechanisms. So the best two studied varieties, we have your microRNAs or your miRNAs and your long coding, long non-coding um, RNAs or your INC RNAs. Fourth, your mobile genetic elements. Example, we have your transposon. So this makes up more than a third of the human genome. These are called your jumping genes, can move around the genome during um, evolution, resulting in a variable copy number and positioning even among closely related species. For example, your humans and other primates. Fifth, we have your special structural regions. So in particular, your telomeres or the ends of your chromosomes and so-called your satellite DNA consisting of large arrays up to megabases in length of repeating sequences. Although classically associated with spindle apparatus attachment, your satellite DNA is also important in maintaining the dense, tightly packed organization of your heterochromatin. So for your non-coding DNA, this is responsible for um, gene expression, gene regulation. So these are your DNAs na ma translate into your proteins. So for your promoter, as discussed earlier, a sequence, a promoter is a sequence of DNA needed to turn a gene on or off. The process of transcription is initiated by the promoter. So usually found near the beginning of the gene, the promoter has a binding site for enzyme used to make a messenger RNA or mRNA molecule. Second, we have your enhancer. This is a regulatory DNA sequence that when bound by specific proteins called transcription factors, they enhance the transcription of an associated gene. Third, we have your silencer. Silencer is a DNA sequence. This is uh, ah, tama. It's a DNA sequence capable of binding transcription regulation factors called your repressors. DNA contains genes and provides the template to produce your mRNA or messenger RNA. That mRNA is then translated into proteins. So when a repressor protein bind, binds to a silencer region of your DNA, RNA polymerase is prevented from transcribing the DNA sequence into your RNA. So with transcription block, the translation of RNA into proteins is impossible. Thus, silencers prevent genes from being expressed as proteins. So technically, they just silence the, uh, they stop the translation of uh, your DNA into proteins. So for your binding sites, binding sites is a position in a protein that binds to and incoming molecules that is smaller in size comparatively. So this is also called your um, ligand. So your ligand binds into your binding site. For your telomeres, your telomeres are the protective cups on the ends of the strands of DNA, which is called your chromosomes. 
which houses our genomes. Centromeres, six centromeres. So centromeres, a constricted region of chromosome that separates it into a short arm, T, and a long arm. Seventh, your transposons, a class of genetic elements that can jump to different locations within the genome. Genome. So, although these elements are frequently called jumping genes, they are always maintained in an integrated site in the genome. Eight, we have your single nucleotide polymorphism. This is a single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP, or your SNP. This is a variation at a single position in a DNA sequence among individuals. For the copy number variations, the last one. This is a type of structural vari vari variation where you have stretch of DNA, which is duplicated in some people and sometimes even triplicated or quadruplicated. And so when you look at the chromosomal region, you will see a variation in the number of copies in normal people. So for your non-coding DNA, for your microRNA or miRNA, they do not code for your proteins. They modulate the translation of target mRNAs, and also they are responsible for your post-transcriptional silencing. For long non-coding RNA, they bind to chromatin and restrict RNA polymerase from, from um, the access from the coding genes within that region. So the importance of your um, human genome is that it has the genetic set of information that separates humans from other living beings. So as it has the data that instructs the body as it progresses to becoming a full human being. Also, people in the field of medicine can use the information on the human genome in understanding and developing new possible ways to treat, cure, and prevent various illnesses or diseases. So we have a video showing the importance of um, the genome. The human genome is the blueprint for the development of the fetus, the child, the middle school student, and the adult. And what the genome does is it encodes all of the machinery for the development of, of the human and the continued physiology. And the reason why the genome is important is because it's loaded with genetic variation, it's loaded with mutations, and it is those variations that significantly influence human health and particularly risk for psychiatric and developmental disorders. So in many ways, you're saying we are our DNA. In a way, that uh, blueprint, if you will, defines really who we are at many different levels throughout our life. Absolutely. The, the genes carry a huge influence on human health, but they also control how the human interacts with their environment. So when people say that disease is a combination of genes and environment, that's absolutely true, but the genes have a big role. And I would guess that as we learn more about the genome, we're learning that environment impacts the genome uh, in a very direct way. So even though it's the nature nurture question that we're trying to puzzle through, we know that nature is very important and in fact that nurture may impact nature. That's absolutely true. Uh, obviously, environmental exposures can actually introduce mutations into the genome, which can influence development. Similarly, uh, the environment can uh, contribute to epigenetic changes that could influence one's physiology. So these are, not, these are not variations that were carried by the individual when they were born, but are acquired. Right. That's all for our discussion. Thank you. Okay, so very good, no? So very good, very good video, no? It basically summarizes uh, uh, the our our objectives for this chapter. Nice, nice session of video. Okay, so next group, who wants to go next?
Okay, who wants to go next? Which group? Our group will go next, Doc, for a while, Doc. Okay, okay. Just, uh... Epigenetics, pada ay, Doc. Okay, the group on epigenetics. Take it away. Hello, Doc. Can you hear me? Hello. Mic test. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, thank you, Doc. Okay, so um, good morning, everyone. We are group one, uh, group one C, and today we will be discussing the role of epigenetics. Hello, <laughs> it's Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. All right. Okay. Take two. Take two. Sorry, guys. All right. So good morning, everyone. We are Group 1C, and we will be discussing instruction number five, which is to discuss the role of epigenetics and to cite examples. Yeah. Before anything else, I think it's very important that we recognize the group members who have made this beautiful presentation possible. All right, so we have Ms. Jillian Gachalian, Ricky Barcelete, Sunny Kumar, Jehan Atif, Faar Sangkula, Hannah Paspausel, Jorge Damada, Stephen Takalos, um, Joseph Garucha, Gabriel Vincent Sosa, yours truly, Edson Enriquez, Julo Vincent Comia, Michael Dublin, Kathy Elena, and Amy Mindelano. So the question is, what is epigenetics? So epigenetics by definition is the study of how cells control gene activity without changing the DNA sequence. So from the name itself, epi, which means on or above in Greek. And together, epigenetic will then describe factors that are beyond or above the genetic code. Epigenetic changes are modifications to DNA that regulate whether genes are turned on or off. These modifications are attached to the gene. And once again, emphasis on do not change the sequence of DNA building blocks. And within the complete set of DNA in a cell, also known as a genome, all of the modifications that regulate the activity of the genes is known as, you guessed it, the epigenome. Okay, so here is a figure which can help us better understand what we refer to as um, epigenetic modifications. So as you can see, modifications are made beyond or outside the DNA sequence. So it does not alter the sequence of the DNA. Otherwise, I guess that's what they call mutation. Next slide, please. All right, here's a better diagram that will better explain certain uh, processes of epigenetic modifications. Namely, we have methyl methylation of the DNA and acetylation below. And by definition, you can, and also based on the diagram, you will see that through the process of methylation, we, it would then result to a tighter packing of nucleosomes. And if you recall from the previous groups, we know that in order for genes to be better transcribed and translated into proteins, you will need to unwind them from their packed um, arrangement. But then with methylation, we then now have a tighter packing of these uh, molecules, which will then 
um, influence as to how easily or how difficult it is to translate uh, this DNA sequences. And the same goes for acetylation. However, the process of acetylation will, re will result in a more loose packing. So better ang iyang chances of being transcribed. Okay, once again, uh, before we proceed, I think it's very important that we know of the definitions. One, what is epigeno? So it is a multitude of chemical compounds that can tell the genome what to do. The human genome is the complete assembly of DNA, all right? And what makes up the epigenome? It is a set of chemical modifications to the DNA and the DNA-associated proteins in the cell, which alter GNA gene, rather, sorry, <laughs> which alter gene expression and, like DNA, are heritable via meiosis and mitosis. The modifications occur as a natural process of development and tissue differentiation and can be altered in response to environmental exposures or disease. So if you recall from the previous group, I believe that was Mr. Colliante's group, they, their video mentioned a very uh, important statement that you will hear in medicine, nurture versus nature. So that is what we are puzzling through when it comes to epigenetics. And there are two types that you can come across um, in the process of epigenetics. These marks, quote unquote marks, are made through methylation or acetylation, as mentioned earlier. All right, so moving on to the main gist of our number, it is going to be the roles of epigenetics and the examples that will go with it. So in cancer, for example, epigenetic changes contribute to the malignant properties of cancer cells. So if we can review a bit, we know that cancer is basically uncontrolled growth. And you know how amazing our genes are. They have so many uh, proteins and molecules that work together in order to whether promote something or to suppress something. And the same goes for um, cancer and the role of epigenetics. Why? Because for one, in the process uh, of growth, we have the growth factor signaling pathway, which is, uh, as you can see, uh, visualized in the diagram found on the right side of your screen. So if you look closely, there is a pathway called the phosphoinositidyl 3 kinase pathway. And this pathway has a breaking mechanism, which is provided by the PTEN, which stands for phosphatase and tensin homolog. And it is a tumor suppressor gene whose function is lost through mutation or epigenetic silencing. All right, so that is a role of, uh, one role of epigenetics in cancer. in mental retardation, all right? So again, we have a diagram to better understand how epigenetics works in mental retardation. There are, in, in mental retardation, there are too many CGGs that, that cause the CPG islands at the promoter region of the FMR1 gene to become methylated. And this is normally not the case. So the syndrome is caused by an abnormality in the FMR1, or also known as the fragile X mental retardation one gene. The process of methylation, as we discussed earlier, will then sort of result to a tighter packing of our nucleosomes. And what happens is this very sequence of genes will not, will have a difficult time in being translated if it would even be translated to begin with. And this will then stop the FMR1 gene from producing an important protein called the Fragile X Mental Retardation Protein, a no-brainer from the name itself. And the loss of this, sorry, that came out wrong. Loss of this specific protein causes Fragile X syndrome. Next slide, please.
a third example as to where one can observe the effects of epigenetics is through epigenetic therapy. So in the previous two cases of cancer and mental retardation, we know for a fact that there is no change in the DNA sequencing. And if you were able to read your books, you will also realize that um, these methylation, acetylation, and all these other epigenetic modifications have a better chance at being reversed. So this is when epigenetic therapy comes in. Though we know for a fact that diseases are composed of several factors, not just the epigenetic modification, it is a great way to sort of approach uh, these diseases and trying to find out a cure uh, or at least a treatment for such disease. So um, here's an example uh, of the processes that takes place in modification and how one is able to reverse this process. Not as easy as it may sound, but it is definitely um, an approach that has been gaining popularity nowadays, especially with cancer. Next slide, please. All right. Inhibitors of DNA methylation. So again, this will better expand our previous slide on uh, the epigenetic uh, treatments, right? So if ever we have a DNA that's methylated, what could be approached, you know, what could be done in order to inhibit this methylation process? So here is an example. Uh, we have 5-azacitidine, 5, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you guys can read and I don't want to pretend like I know how to read this properly, so I'm sorry. But anyway, what this does is this will work by acting like the nucleotide cytosine and incorporating themselves into DNA while it is replicating. Now, after they are incorporated, the drug will then block DNMT enzymes from acting, and this will inhibit the DNA methylation process. Right. So don't worry, guys, we're almost done. Uh, we have the histone deacetylase or HDAC inhibitors, which are drugs aimed at histone modifications. Uh, all right. And what are HDACs? These are enzymes that remove the acetyl groups from DNA as a result of acetylation, for example. And this will then condense chromatin and stop transcription. So this will prove very beneficial. For example, if we have a gene that needs to be, uh, which needs to be suppressed, a gene that would promote tumor growth, for example. And uh, by blocking this process, uh, we are able to then turn, uh, yeah, by blocking HDAC inhibitors, we turn on gene expression. So. Uh, it works however, you know, it, will, it could be used, it is an approach that could be used, um, however, is, you know, it is best for the human physiology. All right, a video for everybody so they can, you know, yeah, enjoy. Enjoy. Here's a conundrum. Identical twins originate from the same DNA, so how can they turn out so different, even in traits that have a significant genetic component? For instance, why might one twin get heart disease at 55 while her sister runs marathons in perfect health? Nature versus nurture has a lot to do with it, but a deeper related answer can be found within something called epigenetics. That's the study of how DNA interacts with the multitude of smaller molecules found within cells, which can activate and deactivate genes. If you think of DNA as a recipe book, those molecules are largely what determine what gets cooked when. They aren't making any conscious choices themselves. Rather, their presence and concentration within cells makes the difference. So how does that work? Genes in DNA are expressed when they're read and transcribed into RNA, 
which is translated into proteins by structures called ribosomes. And proteins are much of what determines a cell's characteristics and function. Epigenetic changes can boost or interfere with the transcription of specific genes. The most common way interference happens is that DNA, or the proteins it's wrapped around, gets labeled with small chemical tags. The set of all of the chemical tags that are attached to the genome of a given cell is called the epigenome. Some of these, like a methyl group, inhibit gene expression by derailing the cellular transcription machinery or causing the DNA to coil more tightly, making it inaccessible. The gene is still there, but it's silent. Boosting transcription is essentially the opposite. Some chemical tags will unwind the DNA, making it easier to transcribe, which ramps up production of the associated protein. Epigenetic changes can survive cell division, which means that they could affect an organism for its entire life. Sometimes that's a good thing. Epigenetic changes are part of normal development. The cells in an embryo start with one master genome. As the cells divide, some genes are activated and others inhibited. Over time, through this epigenetic reprogramming, some cells develop into heart cells and others into liver cells. Each of the approximately 200 cell types in your body has essentially the same genome, but its own distinct epigenome. The epigenome also mediates a lifelong dialogue between genes and the environment. The chemical tags that turn genes on and off can be influenced by factors including diet, chemical exposure, and medication. The resulting epigenetic changes can eventually lead to disease if, for example, they turn off a gene that makes a tumor-suppressing protein. Environmentally induced epigenetic changes are part of the reason why genetically identical twins can grow up to have very different lives. As twins get older, their epigenomes diverge, affecting the way they age and their susceptibility to disease. Even social experiences can cause epigenetic changes. In one famous experiment, when mother rats weren't attentive enough to their pups, genes in the babies that helped them manage stress were methylated and turned off. And it might not stop with that generation. Most epigenetic marks are erased when egg and sperm cells are formed. But now, researchers think that some of those imprints survive, passing those epigenetic traits on to the next generation. Your mother's or your father's experiences as a child, or choices as adults, could actually shape your own epigenome. But even though epigenetic changes are sticky, they're not necessarily permanent. A balanced lifestyle that includes a healthy diet exercise, and avoiding exposure to contaminants may, in the long run, create a healthy epigenome. It's an exciting time to be studying this. Scientists are just beginning to understand how epigenetics could explain mechanisms of human development and aging, as well as the origins of cancer, heart disease, mental illness, addiction, and many other conditions. Meanwhile, New genome editing techniques are making it much easier to identify which epigenetic changes really matter for health and disease. Once we understand how our epigenome influences us, we might be able to influence it, too. We just all love TEDx videos. And that concludes our presentation for instruction number five. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Gabriel. Nice voice. Um, Thank you so much, Doc. <laughs> okay, so epigenetics, no? these are uh, external factors. So this, um, these uh, are outside the DNA. Anything, any, anything that is outside the DNA. We mentioned about methylation and the molecular level. We mentioned about uh, methylation. DNA methylation, histone methylation, acetylation, etc. But you can also include uh, in the clinical level um, experiences, um, stress, um, uh, um, chemicals, radiation no? that can affect the behavior of the DNA. Okay, so it's not only it's not only true that um, diseases only come out from the DNA being you know, um, mutated or there's a mutation, 
but DNA, but uh, diseases also come out uh, from um, the changes that result out of these uh, external factors or epigenetics. Okay, so next group. Any questions so far? Okay, next group. Thank you. Hello, Ma. Don't Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, hi, we're group two, and we're here to discuss about gene editing. So these are our members, and I'm the reporter. I'm Peter John Orsal. And uh, okay, to begin with, um, what is gene editing? Gene editing is a type of genetic engineering in which DNA is inserted, deleted, modified, or replaced in the genome of a living organism. So this is an exciting development in the field of genetics because basically, uh, this allows us to yield high fidelity genome modification that may assure us in the next era of molecular revolution. So the most popular of which is your clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats and the CAS genes. So there are also other gene editing, editing techniques, which includes your meganucleases, zinc finger nucleases, and your talent. So uh, all these are genetic editing techniques that all act on the DNA that creates a double-stranded break and where there could be disruptions in the sequence or there could be precise gene sequence insertions. So the most popular of which is your CRISPR or your cluster regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. It was first identified in the E. coli genome way back in 1987. So these are genetic elements that the bacteria use as a kind of acquired immunity to protect against viruses. So they consist of short sequences that originate from viral genomes and have been incorporated into the bacterial genome. So the CAS or your CRISPR associated genes portion process these sequences and cut matching viral DNA sequence. So these two pioneer scientists were the ones, uh, were the pioneering scientists for the CRISPR Cas9 genome editing technique. So as I mentioned, um, uh, it came from bacteria. So in this figure, you can see the CRISPR system, the DNA here, that helps the bacteria fend off foreign viral DNA. So here is a closer figure of the CRISPR. The yellow protein, this one, the Cas9, attaches to a CRISPR RNA, combines. After it combines, um, if ever a foreign viral DNA invades the bacteria, the CRISPR Cas9 complex cleaves off or destroys foreign bacteria. So here is the closer uh, look on the CRISPR Cas9 complex. So in its original form, it is composed of a CRISPR RNA that is that, that serves as a template for your uh, no for the invading viral bacteria so that it can destroy it. This one. And then um, as I mentioned earlier, the two pioneer scientists were able to attach a guide RNA that will serve as a uh, no, that will serve as a template other than the deletion of foreign viral DNA. So what is this guide RNA? So the guide RNA is a piece of RNA that functions as guides for RNA or DNA targeting enzymes, which they form complexes with. Um, very often, these enzymes will delete, insert, or otherwise alter the target, targeted RNA or DNA. So when bound to a Cas9 nuclease, it cleaves the current phages DNA, which leads to either mutations, insertions, or deletions. So um, after the CRISPR-Cas9 complex creates a double-stranded break, as you can see in this figure, it makes a double-stranded DNA break, uh, there could be two types of repairs or recombination that could happen. One is your non-homologous end joining mechanism. This is error-prone, uh, where there is insertion or deletion. It could be of random mutation. And unlike your homologous repairs, uh, this has a higher capacity for repair as there is no requirement for a repair template. Also, your non-homologous end joining uh, typically just repairs the DNA in a few minutes. Now, the crispr cas system of what is of most importance is your homologous DNA recombination or repair. In this type of repair, there are precise changes 
uh, where a donor DNA is added into the double-stranded break. And in this, uh, no, in this scenario, there is DNA with specific mutation, but it is less efficient your, than your non-homologous repair, but it is more precise. So this plays a prominent role in faithfully duplicating the genome by providing critical support for DNA replication and tel telomere maintenance. So in summary, uh, gene editing is most useful in the treatment of disease that stem from deficiencies or alterations in the genetic code. Gene, uh, genome editing is a powerful scientific technology that can reshape medical treatment and people's lives. So the applications of your CRISPR-Cas9 coupled with your homologous repairs uh, of uh, inherited genetic diseases and the creation of pathogenic mutations for inducible pluripotent stem cells. So by introducing plasmids containing your Cas genes and specifically constructed CRISPR into a eukaryotic cell, the eukaryotic genome can be cut at any desired portion. So what is a major concern for this, it's still there are ethical considerations and the possibility of non-therapeutic use of gene editing on human subjects still remains legal and unethical. So I hope you bear with me. Um, here is a video presentation of uh, to further uh, no, explain the CRISPR-Cas9 system and gene editing. From the smallest single-celled organism to the largest creatures on Earth, every living thing is defined by its genes. The DNA contained in our genes acts like an instruction manual for our cells. Four building blocks called bases are strung together in precise sequences, which tell the cell how to behave and form the basis for our every trait. But with recent advancements in gene editing tools, scientists can change an organism's fundamental features in record time. They can engineer drought-resistant crops and create apples that don't brown. They might even prevent the spread of infectious outbreaks and develop cures for genetic diseases. CRISPR is the fastest, easiest, and cheapest of the gene editing tools responsible for this new wave of science. But where did this medical marvel come from? How does it work? And what can it do? Surprisingly, CRISPR is actually a natural process that's long functioned as a bacterial immune system, originally found defending single cell bacteria and archaea against invading viruses, naturally occurring CRISPR uses two main components. The first are short snippets of repetitive DNA sequences called clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, or simply CRISPRs. The second are CAS, or CRISPR-associated proteins, which chop up DNA like molecular scissors. When a virus invades a bacterium, Cas proteins cut out a segment of the viral DNA to stitch into the bacterium's CRISPR region, capturing a chemical snapshot of the infection. Those viral codes are then copied into short pieces of RNA. This molecule plays many roles in our cells, but in the case of CRISPR, RNA binds to a special protein called Cas9. The resulting complexes act like scouts, latching onto free-floating genetic material and searching for a match to the virus. If the virus invades again, the scout complex recognizes it immediately, and Cas9 swiftly destroys the viral DNA. Lots of bacteria have this type of defense mechanism, but in 2012, scientists figured out how to hijack CRISPR to target not just viral DNA, but any DNA in almost any organism. With the right tools, this viral immune system becomes a precise gene editing tool, which can alter DNA and change specific genes almost as easily as fixing a typo. Here's how it works in the lab. Scientists design a guide RNA to match the gene they want to edit and attach it to Cas9. Like the viral RNA in the CRISPR immune system, the guide RNA directs Cas9 to the target gene, and the protein's molecular scissors snip the DNA. This is the key to CRISPR's power. Just by injecting Cas9 bound to a short piece of custom guide RNA, scientists can edit practically any gene in the genome. Once the DNA is cut, the cell will try to repair it. 
Typically, proteins called nucleuses trim the broken ends and join them back together. But this type of repair process, called non-homologous end joining, is prone to mistakes and can lead to extra or missing bases. The resulting gene is often unusable and turned off. However, if scientists add a separate sequence of template DNA to their CRISPR cocktail, cellular proteins can perform a different DNA repair process called homology-directed repair. This template DNA is used as a blueprint to guide the rebuilding process, repairing a defective gene, or even inserting a completely new one. The ability to fix DNA errors means that CRISPR could potentially create new treatments for diseases linked to specific genetic errors like cystic fibrosis or sickle cell anemia. And since it's not limited to humans, the applications are almost endless. CRISPR could create plants that yield larger fruit, mosquitoes that can't transmit malaria, or even reprogram drug-resistant cancer cells. It's also a powerful tool for studying the genome, allowing scientists to watch what happens when genes are turned off or changed within an organism. CRISPR isn't perfect yet. It doesn't always make just the intended changes. And since it's difficult to predict the long-term implications of a CRISPR edit, this technology raises big ethical questions. It's up to us to decide the best course forward as CRISPR leaves single-celled organisms behind and heads into labs, farms, hospitals, and organisms around the world. Wrap your head around the implications of CRISPR with this playlist on genetics. That's all for gene editing, Doc. Okay, so very nice, no? very nice concept. Uh, if you're able to notice, you we started with um, the cons. Uh, the the uh, these scientists were able to um, observe how a bacteria works against viruses. Okay, so they and they applied it to um, the human genome, specifically the human genome. But there are also other applications such as in plants. No? So this is basically a, a major concept in genetic engineering. Diba? Okay, so next group. Um, I think that's the next group is the last one, right? Yes, doc. Okay. Yes, doc. Yeah, so that will end early. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. We are group three of section C. I am Janet Terra, the reporter. We have our researchers, Michelle Racho, Mani Renz Regulation, Lawrence Yee, and Michaela Ukang. Our PPT makers, Glory Tangarorang, Cheryl Muiko, and Jeffy James Sarte. Zarate. Next, please. Next slide. Okay. We were tasked in the instruction number four, the Human Genome Project. The objectives is to recall the recent research findings regarding the human genome and explain the Human Genome Project. To explain the Human Genome Project, we have its definitions and uh, the, the definition, project goals, and the results. So the Human Genome Project started in 1990s and completed in 2003, was organized by the International Collaborative Research Program, whose goal was the complete mapping and understanding of all the genes of human beings, and all of our genes together are known as our genome. Next, please. The project goals were to identify all the, all the approximately 2,500 genes in the human DNA, determine the sequences of the 3 billion chemical base pairs that make up human DNA, store this information in databases uh, to improve tools for data analysis, transfer related technologies to the private sector, and address the ethical, legal, and social issues that may arise from the project. The HGP has revealed that there are probably about 2,500 human genes 
this ultimate product of the HGP has given the world a resource of detailed information about the structure, organization, and function of the complete set of human genes. Next. So here is a video about the HGP project. For a moment. Humans share about 90% of our DNA with our closest non-human relative, the chimpanzee, and about 99.9% .9 with one another. Scientists know that our DNA codes for things like heart function, neuron formation, and eye color, but there are many things we still don't know. For instance, which DNA segment does what? Which sections of DNA code for more than one trait? Which sections do nothing at all? And can certain genes be switched on and off? The Human Genome Project has been an ongoing effort to sequence the entire human genome. In other words, to map out the order of all its base pairs. Then, scientists hope to determine the function of each gene. In 2001, scientists released a statement that they had mapped 90% of the genome at about 99% accuracy, approximately 3 billion base pairs. However, it's been very difficult to determine the exact function of each gene. The effort has been complicated by pleiotropy, where some genes code for multiple traits, by epistasis, where multiple genes cooperate to determine just one trait, and by epigenetics, where certain genes are switched on and off depending on environmental conditions. Perhaps someday we will be able to use this information to prevent or cure genetic diseases such as cystic fibrosis or sickle cell disease, which have plagued mankind for millennia. Grass, I think no skip me more. Okay, so the Human Genome Project, we will present the re recent research findings. So next, please. Here are the timeline of the HGP. In 2000, the International Human Genome Sequencing Consortium announces that working draft of the human genome. And in 2001, the International Human Genome Sequencing Consortium publishes a draft sequence and initial analysis of the human genome. In 2002, the International HapMap project begins cataloging common human genetic variations and their genomic locations. The draft genome sequence published for the mouse, the first mammal to have its full genome sequence. And in 2003, the Human Genome Project declared finished, which the start of the cogen and start of the ENCODE project. Next, please. In 2004, the landmark paper describing the finished human sequence published, finishing the EU chromatic sequence of human genome. 2005, HapMap report published in Nature. 2006, launch of the first Selexa sequencer, which sequenced one gigabase of data in a single run. Sequencing and analysis of Neanderthal and woolly mammoth genomic DNA. In 2007, the launch of the Human Microbiome Project by the NIH. 
genome-wide association study of 14,000 cases of seven common diseases and 3,000 shared controls published in Nature, Selexa acquired by Illumina. In 2008, the publication of the landmark paper, Mapping and Sequencing of Structural Variation from Eight Human Genomes in Nature, the first time the keyword RNA-Sec appears in publication, 2009 single cell transcriptome sequencing appears, the first comprehensive analysis of cancer genomes is published, including lung cancer and malignant melanoma. In 2010, an international team produces the first whole genome sequence of the Neanderthal genome, the synthetic genome mycoplasma mycoides, completed by J. Craig Venter. And in 2011, the U.S. Supreme Court rules that naturally occurring DNA cannot be patented. FDA approves next generation sequencing for clinical diagnostics application. Next, please. In 2012, the ENCODE project publishes results from cross-consortium integrative analysis in a coordinated set of 30 papers, smart SEC, and single-cell exome sequencing appear. 2013, the zebra fish genome is completed. The CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing is demonstrated in mammalian cells. In 2014, Illumina launched its high sec text and sequencer claiming to have produced the first $1,000 genome at 30 times coverage. In 2015, Oxford nanopores min ion is made commercially available drop sequence appear. Next please. And in 2016, single cell small RNA sequence appears. 2017, Luxterma becomes the first gene therapy to be approved by the FDA. 2018, the Cancer Genome Atlas publishes the Pan Cancer Atlas. And in 2020, MGI, the first sequencing spin out of BGI, announces the first $100 genome. Next, please. So the HGP is a hope for future genetic research, the International HapMap Project, which seeks to discover single nucleotide polymorphisms called SNPs. SNPs are differences in gene lettering among the same species. These differences influence susceptibility to certain conditions and diseases such as diabetes, heart diseases, and cancer. Next, please. The Sang Sanger sequencing in 1997. This is a sequencing technology behind the Human Genome Project that allows scientists to sequence single stretches of around 1,000 nucleotides per channel. This has allowed the identification of XRCC2, a gene that was mutated, is associated with increased risk of breast cancer. Next, please. The G green fluorescent protein development in 2008 by Osamu Shimomura, Martin Chalfi, and Ro Roger Whitesian developed the green fluorescent protein from the bioluminescent jellyfish, the Ikara victoria. The strong green color of this protein appears under blue and ultraviolet light. It can, for example, illuminate growing cancer tumors, shows the development of Alzheimer's disease in the brain or the growth of pathogenic bacteria. Next, please. And lastly, the CRISPR-Cas gene editing technique, which was uh, discussed earlier by Jennifer Dudna and Emmanuel Charpen here for the development of CRISPR-Cas as a gene editing technique. It is a genetic library in bacteria consisting of short repeats of DNA gathered over time from hostile viruses paired with Cas protein that can cut viral DNA. And that would be all for group three, Doc. Thank you. Okay. I see. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jana. So basically, knowing this uh, human, the, the purpose of human genome project, aside from mapping the human genome, no, what's the application? First is prediction, no, it, it, whether this uh, certain sequence of genes is um, 
is will develop into cancer or diabetes. Second, if, for example, uh, how to prevent how to prevent uh, that sequence from forming, okay, prevention. Number two, if that sequence is already present, how to cut it off, so gene editing. Number three, if, um, for example, there's already expression of, of these cancer genes or for uh, disease-related genes into diseases in the form of proteins, how to treat, you know, what's the, uh, medication. So now uh, we are pertaining to personalized medicine. Okay, how to treat them and other ap applications. Um, you can go on with other applications as well. No, so those are the major applications of the human knowing the human genome. Okay, so any questions about this topic? Very very easy. Um, you can um, uh, how to. Yeah, you, you've learned a lot in our session now. How to survive the exam next week. Um, just read it all over again. So it's a very short, short coverage. So I'm very technical. So I'll be asking about uh, what do you mean by this concept? I'll give you a case what is being applied. Uh, what concept is being uh, emphasized in this case? Uh, in Anna, no? So... So that will be 50 items for next week. That uh, um, August 25, Wednesday, 7 to 8. But I will open the exam as early as um, 6.45. So you can enter through the Google Classroom. So I hope all of you from section A and C are able to already um, enter your uh, Google Classroom for A and C. So that, will, that is for my exam lang ha. I don't know with the other professors, but I find um, Google Classroom very convenient for uh, giving exams, in, the, in giving exams. Okay, any questions? Any questions, Gabriel? Okay, see no this. Thank you. Okay, so no questions. So I hope that you're you stay safe and you're doing well and let's call it a day. Okay? You take care. Yes, Doc. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Doc.